But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth to the east of Bethel, and told them, Go up and spy out the region. So the men went up and spied out Ai. When they returned to Joshua, they said, Not all the army will have to go up against Ai. Send two or three thousand men to take it, and do not weary the whole army, for only a few people live there. So about three thousand went up, but they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed about thirty-six of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted in fear and became like water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. The elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, sovereign Lord, Why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we'd been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. Pardon your servant, Lord. What can I say, now that Israel has been routed by its enemies? The Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about this, and they will surround us and wipe out our name from the earth. What then will you do for your own great name? The Lord said to Joshua, Stand up, what are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen, they have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot, st- cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have, made liable, have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you any more unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. Go, consecrate the people. Tell them, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There are devoted things among you, Israel. You cannot stand against your enemies until you remove them. In the morning, present yourselves tribe by tribe. The tribe that the Lord chooses shall come forward clan by clan. And the clan that the Lord chooses shall come forward family by family. And the family that the Lord chooses shall come forward man by man. Whoever is caught with the devoted things shall be destroyed by fire, along with all that belongs to him. He has violated the covenant of the Lord and has done an outrageous thing in Israel. Early the next morning, Joshua made Israel come forward by tribes, and Judah was chosen. The clans of Judah came forward, and the Zerhites were chosen. He made the clan of the Zerites come forward by families, and Zimri was chosen. Joshua made his family come forward man by man, and Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was chosen. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and honour him. Tell me what you have done. Do not hide it from me. Achan replied, It is true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and there it was hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. They took the things from the tent and brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites and spread them out before the Lord. Then Joshua said, with all Israel, then Joshua, together with all Israel, took Achan, son of Zerah, the silver, the robe, the gold bar, his sons and daughters, his cattle, donkeys, and sheep, his tent, and all that he had to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then all Israel stoned him, and after they had stoned the rest, they burned them. Over Achan they heaped up a large pile of rocks, which remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his fierce anger. Therefore, that place has been called the Valley of Achor ever since. The New Testament reading is taken from Acts um, 4, verse 32 until 511 on page 1096 of the Church Bibles.
All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in, in them all that there was no needy person among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them and brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his, wife, with his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, what is the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Great to see you all here. My name's Tom Woodbridge. And, well, I wonder what you make of that passage. Maybe you came to church for the first time for a while last Sunday to our Festival on the Green service. And you come back this week and you hear that. What's going on? Maybe you remember back to where we were in our series in Acts empowered for mission and so far you could be forgiven for the thinking it's going pretty well isn't it the holy spirit is given to the people at pentecost the gospel the gospel is proclaimed to the people and so we see 2,000 people 3,000 people converted believing at the end of peter's sermon right at the start of acts numbers added daily as the gospel continues to go out At the beginning of chapter 4, we're told 5,000 men believe, not including the women and children, so add that to the number, and the numbers are going up. The gospel is going out with power, and so surely there is nothing that can put a stop to it, right? And yet now we get to this, and we get to a bit of a stumbling block as we come across this, as Luke records the beginning of opposition to the gospel. Two weeks ago, we looked at the opposition from outside the church as the Sanhedrin, the temple courts, tried to put a stop on this gospel growth. And now we witness something that we haven't seen before. We witness the reality of opposition from within the church. Within the first group of believers, where it seems like everything is going so well, And Luke tells us about the first recorded sin. And it all sounds a bit shocking, doesn't it? Did this really happen like this? Surely that is far too harsh for what they did. Why do you include it, Luke? Why do you need to tell us about it? Just keep telling us about how everything's going so well, about how the the disciples, the apostles, the believers are just getting on well and the gospel's growing. Why do we need to know about this? And so as we come to this, Luke wants to make it abundantly clear that whilst the church is experiencing wonderful growth, opposition is a reality. And opposition from within the church is a reality. And so it is important that we hear this lesson today as well. Because 
maybe we can feel like we're in the middle of an exciting time here at Inspire as we join together with St. James, looking back, to, looking back at a wonderful week at the Festival on the Green. Things are going well, right? And so the warning is, be on your guard, because opposition is a reality. And opposition from within is a reality. And so as we look into this passage, and as we look to answer some of the questions that these verses can bring up, I hope we're able to see the wonderful work of God throughout these verses, as we see how he builds his church, and as we see how he protects his church. And so we'll split it into two. We see the wonderful picture of the unity of the church, and we see the reality of the threat to the early church. So let's firstly look at the unity of the church. At this time of year, um, in the sporting calendar, many sporting seasons are coming to an end, and so many things are decided, mainly that of who goes up and who goes down. And it's interesting that the teams that end up going down, the accusations start coming out about those teams that maybe they weren't so together as it seems. As they go down, the accusations come out that there's just division. People are looking out for themselves. They're not all pulling in the same direction. This week, I was chatting to a friend who uh, plays for a rugby club, um, and they were involved in a little bit of a relegation dogfight. They had three games of their season remaining. They needed to win two of them to stay up. They won the first, good start. Lost the second, and that was when the problems started coming. And my friend would tell me, he'd look around the group and you could just see divisions. You saw people who were just resigned to relegation, couldn't be bothered to try. Some of them were even looking at the teams in the league below thinking, oh, that's a long journey over there, won't like that. Or that'll be a nice place to travel to next season, won't be too bad going there. And so he realised that if they were to have any chance of staying up, of winning that final game, he knew they had to pull together. He knew they had to get united in what they were looking to do, to have any chance of avoiding relegation. Now you know what they want, uh, how they got on. <laughs> um, they went on to win. They managed to do it, pull their team together, and so got that unity back to be able to pull in the same direction. Let me read verses 32 to 35 to us. And as I do, listen out to the wonderful picture of unity that Luke gives us. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there was no needy person among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the, the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. What a wonderful picture that must have been. A church united in, as one, in heart and mind, the things that they love, the things that they desire, the way that they're thinking together, sharing what they had with one another, ensuring that there was no needy person from amongst them. Could you imagine it? I wonder, do you think we're like it in any way? Their unity in heart and in mind played out in a radical attitude to their own possessions. It was selfless, verse 32. It was sacrificial, verse 34. It was voluntary. Luke tells us from time to time, as the need arose, people chose. And you see, it wasn't as if no one had their own private possessions. It wasn't as if everything was everyone's. We see later on, as Peter comes to confront Ananias, he says it was yours to do what you wanted to do with it. But it was that no one claimed his possessions as their own. And so, although in fact in law and in, uh, in fact they were their own possessions, they didn't claim them to be. But rather, 
by being one in heart and mind. They had an attitude so radical that they thought of their possessions as being something to be used for anyone who might be in need. Where does it come from? Where did it all spring from? Well, we ended the last uh, two weeks ago by seeing they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, verse 31. And then verse 33, God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all as the apostles proclaimed the resurrection of Jesus, as God's grace was working so powerfully within them, it led to a community united in heart and mind. It led to a community that valued people over possessions. A growing church is a united church. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but shared everything they had. What a challenge to us all. Hear what John Calvin, the great theologian, wrote about these verses. We must have hearts that are harder than iron if we are not moved by the reading of this narrative. In those days, the believers gave abundantly of what was their own. We in our day are content not just jealously to retain what we possess, but callously to rob others. They sold their own possessions in those days. In our day, it is the lust to purchase that reigns supreme. At that time, love made each man's own possessions common property for those in need. In our day, such is the inhumanity of many that they begrudge to the poor a common dwelling upon earth, the common use of water, air, and sky. What a challenge to us all, to be united in one heart and mind. And so with the changes we've seen over the last six months, uh, maybe a timely challenge to us all here at Inspire St. James as we've gone through the transition of moving from the Museum of London to here at St. James as we've come together with another church family to not be two separate churches that happen to be led by the same ministers that happen to meet in the same venue, but to be one church, united as one. I wonder, would we, would you describe us as a church united as one in heart and mind? Let's certainly be praying that we would be. How does this work its way out, itself out? What does this look like practically? Well, in so many ways. And this passage gives us one practical outworking of it, a wonderful generosity towards others so that there was no needy person amongst them. For us today, maybe it's ensuring, ensuring that we definitely get along to the big church lunches when they happen, so that we can meet someone, meet others from the morning congregation, so that we can be united as one together. Maybe it's getting along to the 4pm service slightly earlier, or staying behind afterwards for a little bit longer, so we can chat to others, meet someone we've never met before, Find out about people, care for people, serve people. But of course, it's, here it's, it's a lot more deeper than just coming early or staying a little bit later. It's being one in heart and mind. It's a love and a care for one another that plays out in how we use our possessions. It's valuing people over possessions. And so let me pull out two practical applications for us. Often our unity with one another will be seen in how we're prepared to use our calendar and our cash, or our money. We don't really use cash these days, but I needed a seat to go with calendar. Does your calendar reflect the unity as one with our fellow brothers and sisters? Could you open your house maybe one evening, invite people round to have dinner with others here at Inspire St. James? Are you able to give up the time regularly to meet someone from your Inspire group for coffee each week, to ask them how they're doing, to look out for them, to ask them to look out for you, to pray with each other, to look at the Bible together? Does your cash reflect our unity as one? 
I wonder if I was to ask you to look through your last month's bank statement. Did you spend more on yourself or on others? Can I take this opportunity to challenge? Are you committed to giving financially, regularly to the church? An outworking of our unity in heart and mind. The early believers were prepared to sell their land to provide the church with money so that it would meet the needs of others, so that there was no needy person amongst them. And so Luke goes on to show us two different examples. One good, one not so good. First, first we're introduced to Joseph, nicknamed Barnabas, who we get to see a lot through Acts. In chapter 11, he's the one who goes and encourages the church in Antioch, who searches for Saul in Tarsus. He's the one who accompanies Paul on his first missionary journey. And here, he is one of those who sells his property and gives the money to the church. And then, seemingly the same act, yet turning turning out to be very different, we get the tragic example of Ananias and Sapphira. And so it shows us the threat to the church, the threat to the church. At first glance, it can be easy to think that surely Ananias and Sapphira have simply done the same generous act as Barnabas and as others. However, as we look a little bit closer and as we see the consequence to their actions, we can see that it is very different. So what is it that Ananias and Sapphira get so wrong? What is it that they do wrong? Is it that they keep part of the money to themselves? Well, if you look down at verse 4, it seems as if they have every right to do that. Do you see it? Verse 4, Peter says, Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? Peter's saying, it's yours before you sold it. You don't have to sell it. And, and after you've sold it, the money's yours to do with it what you want. You don't have to give all the money. No, what goes wrong is that they give part of the money whilst claiming that they've given it all. And you see that in Sapphira's response to Peter in verse 8. And so in doing so, they are lying and deceiving the church. But much more serious than that, Peter highlights. Well, verse 3, they've lied to the Holy Spirit. Verse 4, they've not just lied to human beings, but to God. Verse 9, they have conspired to test the Spirit of the Lord. And there are serious consequences. What's caused them to do this? Well, it seems part of it may be a desire for some kind of public recognition. They want to look good in being another who sells their land and gives the money to the church. They want to gain the same reputation of generosity as others have got. And yet their motives are all wrong. As John Stock commented on this, rather than wanting to relieve the poor, they just wanted to fatten their own ego. They wanted the credit and prestige for sacrificial generosity without the inconvenience of it. I wonder, could you ever be tempted to do something similar? Tempted to be seen as if you're giving so much to the church, whether in time or money. Tempted to hope to be seen by the ministers or by others that you're giving so much, and yet in reality, you know that it's not giving too much up. Be on your guard, Luke warns. And we'd also be foolish in this passage to ignore the temptation for just a little bit more. The hold that money here in this example and material possessions can have over people. One commentator said of this, wherever wealth is involved, sin is never far away. And so it was for Ananias and Sapphira. And I wonder if you notice the similarities in the Old Testament reading that was read out to us in Joshua chapter 7. A similar situation 
where a similar sin is committed. Just as the Israelites, God's chosen people, were entering into the promised land, a sin is committed, a desire for material possessions, and so a serious consequence for Achan. And here, just as the church, God's chosen people, are establishing themselves, a sin is committed, a desire for wealth, and so serious consequences for Ananias and Sapphira. Wherever wealth is involved, sin is never far away. Are you aware of the dangers of money and material possessions could be over you? Growing up, I dreamt of being a professional footballer. I've just about given up that dream now I've hit 30. Um, No, I reckon it was about mid-teens where I finally came to the realisation that it wasn't going to happen. And so my dream changed slightly. Instead of living as a professional footballer, here's what I wanted. I just dreamt of being paid just once to play football. To receive money for just one game of football would be an absolute dream. Could you imagine it? And I did it. My last year of university, I managed somehow to get selected for county. Only came on for the last 20 minutes. And yet on the coach home, the brown paper envelopes came round. 10 quid. (laughs) And you know what? I loved it. I loved it. It was such a good feeling. And do you know what happened? Oh, imagine getting that every game. Imagine playing for a club where I get a brown paper envelope at the end of every single game. My dream changed, and I just wanted more. John Rockefeller, an American businessman and billionaire, was once asked, how much money is enough? And he simply replied, just a little bit more. Will you be on your guard against the temptations of money and material possessions in a world that is shouting at you to get onto the property ladder before it's too late? A world that is shouting at you to work your way up to the next paycheck. It got hold of Ananias and Sapphira. And there were serious consequences. As we saw the devil working from outside the church to try and stop the gospel spreading, so here we see the devil working from within the church. One of my favourite TV shows um, is Spooks. Um, Great show as the tension mounts, MI5 trying to foil the plans of possible attacks on the UK. So I was thrilled in 2015 when a film came out, Spooks the Greater Good, um, which showed, uh, here's the plot, I won't spoil it too much for you, um, which showed the UK holding hostage um, a potential terrorist who managed to escape and was rescued. And the great Harry Pierce, the head of MI5, was blamed for the incident, and so he went into hiding trying to escape the clutches of his own organisation. And whilst outside of his own organisation, he was convinced that the reason for it was a mole within MI5, working from within. And so he tried to give everything. Why? Well, because he knew that a mole within MI5 had the potential to bring down everything the organisation looked to do. And in a similar way, but with much more devastating consequences, the devil uses a similar tactic, looking to infiltrate the church, looking to create opposition from within. And it's not just here. If you go on in Acts, to Acts chapter 20, Paul gathers the leaders of the Ephesian church, and he warns them, saying, even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard, Paul says. So be on your guard. And so in the account of Ananias and Sapphira, we then see God will protect his church. God will protect his church. I wonder what your initial reaction was as you read what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. Shock? It's a bit harsh, isn't it? God shouldn't do that. God can't do that. And yet God does react like this because God will protect his church. This sin compromised the church. It compromised the witness 
of the church to the watching world around it. It compromised the unity of the church. It compromised the leadership of the church. This affects God's church. And so God will protect his church. And so whilst we might initially react, I can't believe God would do this, we must ask, well, what would the alternative be? Could you imagine if God didn't intervene through Peter? If there was no punishment for Ananias and Sapphira? If God just turned a blind eye to sin? Let me suggest that would be the scary thing. Because that would be a God who either doesn't care about sin enough to do something about it, or doesn't care about his church enough to protect it. And wonderfully, neither of those are true. In the account of Ananias and Sapphira, we see a God who does care about sin, that he will deal with it. And he does care about his church, so he will protect it. A God who deals with sin to protect his church is a good thing. A church which looks to deal with sin to protect the church is a good thing. It's not a church to avoid, but a church to be a part of. And so there can often be a negative reaction when the topic of church discipline is raised, calling people to account. And the funny thing is we would expect it in any other walk of life in the world, in the world of work, in the sports club, in the community club. Yet when it comes to church, we kind of feel that the church should just turn a blind eye. My business has nothing to do with your business. Yet here at Inspire St. James, we're a church that's committed to training godliness. We want to be committed to help one another change. We want to be committed to protecting God's church. And so the leaders, Peter and Mark, have put together a paper to say, hey, here's how we're going to be committed to be a church that trains in godliness. So if you haven't, let me encourage you to grab hold of this and read it. There's copies at the back so that you can see how we can be a church that's committed to train and to grow in godliness. And what's the result? How does this all finish? Well, there is great fear in the church. Did you see it? Verse 5, after Ananias dies. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died, and great fear seized all who heard what had happened. And again after Sapphira dies, verse 11, great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Great fear. But it's not an awful fear of God, people who are terrified of him. No, it's not an awful fear but a fearful awe, a fearful awe of the God who is serious about sin, a right response to a God who will deal with sin, a right response to God who will protect his people. God will grow his church. God will protect his church. And what a wonderful reality and assurance that is for his church. God is on a mission to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And we get the wonderful opportunity to be a part of that mission here in London. And opposition within the church will not stop it. God is on a mission, and his mission is unstoppable. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you love your church, that you will protect it. Thank you that you are serious about sin, that you will deal with it. And so, Father, help us to examine ourselves, to reflect on the areas where maybe we live in the way that you don't want us to live. Help us to be quick to repent. And thank you that you are faithful and just and forgive us of our sins. And Father, will you protect your church? Will you continue your mission? And will you continue to grow your church? In your name I pray.
Amen.